My love for my mom, we were super close, but even in her absence on earth, even after her death, I feel like I love her more than ever. Welcome to Mamas in Spirit, a podcast pointing you towards God in everything you are and everything you do. I'm Lindy Wynn, and it's a blessing to be with you. Thank you, everyone, for gathering and joining us for this mini retreat and a podcast for Lent, for this time of Lent. And we are recording. I'm here with the lovely Megan Nix. Megan, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Lindy. And we were just praying about being daughters in Christ and sisterhood in Christ. And that's what we hope for all of us gathering and for brothers in Christ too, because I know we have male listeners and we have male guests. We have three of seven of this Latin series are with males. And so funny, I joke with my husband because one of his friends once called him a brochacho. (laughs) We will have brochachos in spirit, (laughs) papas in spirit on two. And it's so much on my heart on this, what I like to think of as casual Friday, because we're actually recording on a Friday. I'm here in this sweatshirt and it was actually my mom's from the 1980s and it has me and my brothers on it. But if you join us on YouTube, you can barely see us because it's like that old digital. I don't even know if it's digital actually. I know nothing really, even though I have this podcast. <laughs> but yeah, it's airbrushed. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know what it is, but you can barely awesome. see us. We were little kids in there and somehow I landed with a sweatshirt and I'm a very sensitive and nostalgic human being. And so I just think of the tenderness of that time together and my love of my brothers and just that we're here as brothers and sisters in Christ and that I want us to truly know one another. So please reach out to me at any time if there's any way that I can be supportive of you or pray for you. And I reminded Megan and we prayed for the fact that we are sisters in Christ. So no matter how many times we're ever together in this lifetime, we are that deeply knit and God wants us to know each other that fully. So Megan, so looking forward to hearing your heart today and your story. And in that spirit and in the Holy Spirit, let us begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Dearest Lord, you know today that we are going to be talking about remedies for sorrow and Aquinas's beautiful insights and thoughts to bless us all and point us towards you. But yet what we're really looking at is the sorrow that's been in or maybe in our hearts and Lord, that you meet us there. Just like Jesus in the garden, any sorrow that we're ever carrying in our life, really ultimately you are the remedy. So Lord, we just pray today that we crack our hearts wide open to you, that we trust you so fully and surrender our hearts and our lives completely to you so that you can do the work, the holy work, the transformation that only you can do. In your name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So Megan, I mentioned this to Megan before we started today. I noticed, Megan, when I read your book, Remedies for Sorrow, that you dedicated your book to your mom and that struck my heart from the very beginning and I'd wanted to ask you about that and you've given me a little bit of an insight into that. So in the spirit of sorrow and of God meeting us there and of weeping, which is one of the first remedies of sorrow in the first chapter in your book, I'd love for you to start at the beginning of your story. So the story in the book starts with my second daughter being born. And when she was born, my mom was present. My husband was not there. And I'll explain why in a second, but when she was born, her name is Anna. She was born totally silent and it was dawn and it was just this room like full of maternal electricity. And then her silence and I could tell she was very, very small, just ratcheted up this sacred feeling, but also this worrisome intuition that I had that something was different about her and something might be wrong. And uh, I could tell that she was alive. She was staring straight at me and my mom was looking at both of us. My mom was a pediatric nurse actually. So she was very calm in the moment, but I knew her heart was also alight with these worries and questions. And the midwife handed Anna to me and I laid her on my chest and she still didn't make any sound. And so they called an OB that was on call at the hospital and they rushed her over to the corner and rubbed her with towels. And a couple of seconds later, she cried, but it was, it was a small cry and they waited her and I was like, is she okay? Is she okay? And the doctor or the nurse said, she's okay, but she only weighs five pounds. And she was 
40 weeks. So I knew between her silence and, and her size that there was this mystery to her. And in no way did it reduce my awe and my love for her. I think a lot of parents have this same feeling where they're like, how could I ever love a second child? Like I love the first or like I love the fourth or whatever. And and each time it's just incredible, the elasticity of our heart that like we just fill it more and more. And even in the midst of these worries, my love was just bursting and my mom's was too. And that started this investigation into what was going on with her. And a lot of it I did alongside my mom, not only because she was a nurse, but because she was my best friend. And I did dedicate the book to her about a year before it was published. And little did I know that my mom would become very sick and she would actually die right before it came out. That's so moving. And you are so poetic and your heart is so poetic. And you talked about the elasticity of the heart, Megan. And I noticed when I was reading your book, your words reflect your soul so beautifully and so powerfully. And and I'm talking right now too, because you're getting weepy, which is understandable because the significance of that loss. And when I think about you talking about the elasticity of the heart and that room being filled with the love of woman and of motherhood and your own mother being there as you were becoming a mother the second time, it is so deeply moving. And there's something too that it was at dawn because there was something dawning anew in your life and in your heart and a new season in your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And actually my mom, she died at dawn too. So yeah, it's a time of day that's an important time of day for me, for sure. Spiritually, physically, and circumstantially, it's just something that's very significant in my life. And like you were saying, the book is about these remedies for sorrow, which I did not discover until many years into writing it. I can't even remember who had suggested them. It might have been my brother who's a priest, but St. Thomas Aquinas had these ideas in the Middle Ages when he was prolifically writing and publishing his work that sorrow could be remedied with these five fairly simple daily acts. And the first of those is weeping. And as I was writing my book about my daughter and getting to to know her and there was just so much sorrow about her potential losses and and what her disease may have taken away from her I really did find that weeping was this way of Aquinas says we turn our soul's intent we we disperse our soul's intent onto outward things and it did feel very cathartic once I realized this like I think in today's culture we cover it up you know we we try not to cry even just now like you feel like oh I should stop that before people hear me. It might reduce my professionalism or might make me seem too emotional. And yet, like you say, and like your whole show is built around, that is where we meet each other most deeply is in that vulnerability. And so when I started to really weave these remedies for sorrow into the writing of the book and into my life, it changed my life. And just to back up a little bit, we've, we found out that my daughter had this congenital disease that I had caught during pregnancy that could cause death deafness, blindness, cerebral palsy, epilepsy, autism, stillbirth, early infant death. And so it was just this time of deep sorrow when we had no idea what our child was going to be like. And we had to sort of, my husband and I, who he wasn't there at the birth because he was in Alaska where we live during the summer. He He's a very, very involved and excellent dad, but we had decided he would be in Alaska when I gave birth to Anna. And we flew up there, got her diagnosed diagnosis on this island in Alaska where we live, where there are no pediatric specialists or anything that we would have needed to deal with this diagnosis. And when we when we got there, he he enveloped us in this stability. And I forget why I was bringing Luke up, but we got there and, and we got her diagnosis there. And so there really was this time period for many years of unknowns about the progressiveness of her disease and why I had never heard of it. It's called congenital genital CMV, which stands for cytomegalovirus. And it's the leading cause of birth defects. But it turns out, I found through my research that obstetricians don't disclose it to pregnant women thinking that we can't handle the truth. And that was just so unethical to me and so invalidating to look at women who are more capable, more capacious during pregnancy than any other time in the human experience. Like you're 
physically more capable of growth and development than any other time in the human span of life. And our doctors are saying we can't handle this truth that CMV exists. And so the the writing of the book was really like an excavation of why do we not trust mothers with this knowledge. The knowledge is that CMV is contagious in the saliva of toddlers. So during pregnancy, you can be more careful by not eating your kids' snacks and drinking your own water bottle and, you know, these fairly simple hygienic measures. But what is it about our culture that is shorting us the opportunity to know that? And and so the book became really an investigation of motherhood and eventually the depth that I found in the disabilities of the children that I was meeting through my daughter and through the community that we found ourselves in. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. And for some reason, that word dawn just keeps coming back to my heart, Megan, and that vision and that idea, even though clearly I was not there, (laughs) but of you being in that hospital room with your new baby who was silent and so beautiful. In the book, I think you talked about her dark hair and her -hmm. her dark eyes. Yeah. Like so many babies, she... She started out that way and then her hair became light and her eyes are actually this like really minty green like my husband's. But she was this, you know, sort of this like hole that we fall into and we love our children. It's like they just sort of like we just fall into their soul looking at their eyes. And for sure, that was that moment where I just fixed my eyes on hers and was like, I just felt this total change in my heart. Yes. And I think that too is why that word dawn keeps coming back because there's something about that rim that touches on the dawn of the boundlessness of love, the love that your mother has for you, because even when people pass that love is still active. And then also the dawn of this new beginning with your second child, that you are going to learn the boundlessness of your own mother's heart. And you talked about the elasticity of the heart. I imagine, and and I also have children and children with disabilities, that the way that the heart grows and stretches, like I think about how scripture talks about a heart of flesh and how it stretches and is elastic and even wraps in a sense the hearts of our children children up in our own in ways that we could never imagine and how we will learn to love and care for them in ways that we never could have imagined. And I know your husband is a fisherman in Alaska. And you also talked about something else that that really touched my heart and soul. And you talked about Alaska and you talked about the beauty of the landscape and how it's almost indescribable, yet the difficulty of the landscape. Alaska can be a very difficult place to live. And I think about that, that sorrow in a sense, because I don't know about everybody listening, but sometimes when I see something really beautiful, like I'm so embarrassed to say this, but it's true, like the snow, I'm not used to it. And it's like so beautiful, but I feel so sorrowful too, when I look out at the quiet of the snow. And that is something that is just still unfolding in my heart, in my life. And that could be because of loss too, like the transition of moving away from people that I love so dearly and moving to a new place. Yet there's something about nature that really touches the soul. And you talking about dawn and those of you who may live in a place like Tennessee, when I think about the dawn and especially the mornings of dew and of fog, it is so mysterious to use a word that you used before. And life is mysterious. God is mysterious. We're always reaching for God who's ultimately, we will never touch in this lifetime, but hopefully eternally. And I think about love that way too, and the love of your heart received by your mother and then shared with your child. Yeah, I think that so much of what you said is so beautiful. It's actually snowing right now outside my window. And I do think that all our love here is heartbreaking. And so was God's love for us. I mean, there's always pain implicit in the deepest love. And that's a mystery too. It seems like, why does it, why do we need to suffer? Why, why did Christ need to suffer? And yet it is in those crucibles that we are closest to God, that we forge a new love level in our relationships, for sure, my marriage and my relationship with my parents was deepened by our daughter's suffering. And by learning this new way to parent, this new dawn of therapies and atypicality and looking back and being like, gosh, we were complacent in the absence of suffering. And I think, you know, the afflictions that we encounter, because we all will, their 
they're both full of love and often full of sorrow. And one does not cancel the other. They just coexist on earth here. And and I do think for me, for sure, creation is another remedy for sorrow, the beauty of creation, whether that's a stunning time of day. I also really like dusk. I know in France, they call it the blue hour. And I love to walk our dog at dusk, not just because of the change of light, like around where we live. We live in Colorado the rest of the year and we live in view of this big plateau and it always changes those times of day the most of all. The whole mountain changes in color at dawn and dusk and the outline around it and the sky above it and the street below it. You know, everything is different during those brief hours. And I also love to look into other people's homes at dusk when the light is golden and you can just feel it's the time when families are together. And in Alaska, what's difficult for me, actually, now that we're talking, I've never even put this together. There's no dawn or dusk. We live there in the summer. And so there's 20 hours of light. So if I were to watch the sunrise, which I'd never have, I may have seen it like (laughs) once in a while when I'm unfortunately waking with a child that I wish was sleeping, but that would be at like three in the morning or four in the morning is sunrise. And then sunset is at like midnight in the summer and we're long past bedtime at that point. And so it's a severe beauty in Sitka. It's the sea and mountains that come straight out of the sea. It's light all the time, but it's often this obscure light that is covered in fog and mist. So it is this metaphorical place for me that like even beauty comes with this challenge of every day that like even when we have visitors, I'm always like, well, prepare yourself because if it's foggy, you will not even see the mountains across the sound from our house. They are totally opaque if the fog is thick, which it often is. And it rains like 300 days of the year there. And so like you, I'm out of my element there. I'm from Colorado where there's 300 days of sun. And so while the fog is beautiful, it's also painful for me. I like summer. I like heat. And yet it just is this reminder that it's just out of our control. And there are beauty is just always a surprise. You know, it, it really is. I think this morning waking up to snow, that was a total surprise. In Alaska, you know, as the fog parts midday, the kids will run to the window and watch it kind of like unfold itself from the mountains. And you see why people, you know, build their homes with a view when they can, because it's, it heals our soul to look at what has been made for us. And I think it makes me more prayerful. Like I walk in Colorado in this open space behind our house and it's where I do my deepest thinking, you know, out in this field where I can see the plateau and there's often deer and other wildlife. And so I think our lives in Alaska have created just immense challenges for me, but I would not trade the beauty for being stationary as much as part of me desires that. Isn't that so much a reflection of love itself, what you just said, because I'm going to imagine, Megan, from my own experience too, is that I would never change the challenges or the severity of some of our situations because of the love. Like the love is so profound and love does overcome all and all situations because loss, like the loss of your mother, that's so difficult. Like there are no words for how difficult I imagine that that is and that has been. And also the plight to care for a child who's more fragile and who needs more protection, who's more vulnerable. I have two children that are very, very vulnerable and it it requires so, so much. And at times, speaking of Lent, it can seem like a small pea passion that I say at times like that road can be so trying and so difficult, yet God does overcome everything. The light does outshine the darkness. The love overpowers any difficulty or any challenge. So even with the loss, even the loss of life at times that we experience, that love is irreplaceable and makes everything meaningful. Yeah. My friend and I were talking this week. She she lost a baby during pregnancy. She lost a baby during second trimester. And we were saying like, how is it that even after the loss, our love is almost stronger. Like my love for my mom, we were super close. But even in her absence on earth, even after her death, I feel like I love her more than ever. And while I would have taken away some of her suffering, I also just believe that she, like you said, is still so present in my life in so many ways. And that that love is now, now I'm able to like 
see our love, unfortunately, with this new maturity because of it's not being here present with me. And I think all the time and I pray for her to pray for us and I feel a different intimacy than I was necessarily able to articulate to her when she was on earth. And my friend and I were just saying like, that must be such a testament to life after this life because if these people were just gone, definitely, we would be in agony. And yet there are powerful moments of comfort and intimacy, even in that deep loss. Yes, I love what you're saying. And you're talking about really the integration of both the dynamics of loss and of sorrow. And you use the word agony, yet closeness and intimacy and consolation. Can you talk a little bit more about that, Megan? And here you wrote this book, Remedies for Sorrow. Can you talk about the sorrow of the loss of your mom and then where it has most been remedied most intimately and personally for you? Well, let me start with the remedies that come after weeping, because I think they have actually helped me as sort of guidelines when I do feel more lost. So after weeping, which is really like crying hard anytime, anywhere. And as my mom was dying, that was just such a part of the process, like just almost more so while she was dying than than after she died. The second one is contemplation of the truth. And that is like the truth that we will all face this passion and passion means like a handing over or a surrender and that there are these prayerful ways to approach that. I read this book called The Purpose of Waiting by Jeannie Ewing. And I forget the subtitle is like persevering when God says not yet. And I felt this like so many times in the writing of my book. And then and then later with my mom, while we were like just praying for her to be well and and to overcome some of these things. And, and Jeannie Ewing says there's these two types of waiting, active waiting, where we're like joyfully expecting something and then passive waiting where we are approaching a passion where we need to surrender. And in this passive waiting where we will all inevitably end up and and spend a ton of our lives, there are certain things that we can do during that time where we see it as this time of growth, not of loss of our autonomy. It's really that like in these times of surrender, that is where God is most present. And we are, she says that we're more acutely aware of others during these times of passion that we can be in this almost numb state. And yet, you know, when my mom was dying, there was just this while we were, you know, I was waiting for her to die. But I knew exactly what other people who were caring for her were experiencing. I knew what her caretakers had had for breakfast. I could tell from the look on their faces when I would walk in if it was a good day or a bad day. I could tell that my brothers were hopeful or despairing. And I could tell, you know, just my kids sort of absorption of the situation was very acute to me. And so... Aquinas's third remedy after contemplation of the truth, which whatever that truth is for each person will look different, but but really the truth is that we are nothing without God. And that that third remedy is the company of others. And in the writing of my book, in the raising of our daughter, I found so much comfort in people who could be with me in those vulnerable places and not dismiss them, not try to make things better and approach things placatingly. It was like the people who could just be with me and not even say anything were the ones that I just felt so healed by. That was a real remedy, just the presence of people in a loving way. The fourth remedy is pleasure. And this was so interesting to me that in the wake of my daughter's diagnosis and really not knowing anything that we would be looking at in terms of her outcomes, it in no way reduced our joy. And same with my mom dying, like even after my mom died, where I thought like when I lose this person who's pivotal to my life, I will lose the way that I enjoy things. And it's actually like the opposite. Like I feel like now my kids are like so just incredible to me because I knew what they were to her. And with my book, with my daughter, so we found out shortly after she was diagnosed that she's profoundly deaf. And for a little while, I think this was part of that like passive waiting and just like feeling really sort of cut off from my senses. I really avoided music for a while. Like I did not go into any store where it might be playing. I wouldn't play it in the house. I didn't turn it on in the car. But my older daughter, her name's Zaylee, she is and was 
very musical. And at one point she said to me, mom, what happened to the music? And I was like, I have to provide this to her. And so after she asked that, we just started playing music like all day, every day. And I'm holding this deaf child who can't hear it. And she was so joyful. She could feel us, you know, dancing. And after that, it was like music, even in the wake of her diagnosis, was like so foundational to our family. And we played it all day. We played it in the car. We played it at home. We went into places. And and certainly there were times when I would hear a song and could hardly bear the beauty of it. But it is what enticed us to eventually get her cochlear implants. And so she she does hear now through her cochlear implants. But all the same, this pleasure was almost concentrated by absence and same same with my mom and so I think even after death for people who are tending to the dying for the first time like your ability to feel joy will not be dampened even after that loss and and I think that's even more the case when you live with a hopeful heart and then finally the fifth remedy is taking warm baths and taking naps and so in the book that changed into like caring for the body like caring for our medical system differently and like caring for each patient differently where I came across this term and this entire field called narrative medicine where doctors slow their entire practice down. Some even reduce their practices who are involved with narrative medicine so that they can understand each of their patients' entire life stories and they can treat them then on this deep, deep level, not just the chief complaint. And so So that part of the book, you know, is really about like when we care for our outward bodies, we're actually healing our inner selves. And for sure, because we're part of God's creation. So we have to treat our bodies in this way that honors them and and sees ourselves as a work of art that needs care and reverence. And, you know, this was really visible to me as my mom was dying was like my brother, who's a priest, he he would say, because she was kind of pushing us away. She was a nurse and didn't want to be a bird. And and he was like, we just have to keep caring for her and like showing her her dignity, even in the loss of her mobility. You know, she had taken this cancer treatment and was just suffering from the effects of the infusion therapy and had had a severe adverse reaction to it that would become terminal. And so we were just seeing the loss of her faculties. And he was like, we show up, we care for her, and we just keep bringing her truth and beauty. And that is also so implicit in this fifth remedy of caring for the body is like continuing to provide for the body until its very last breath in both ways that are physically sustaining and spiritually sustaining. Thank you for sharing all of that, Megan. And I love how your daughter asked you, where's the music? Because I think that's so much of the heart of what you're saying. And you just talked about your brother saying that you both still needed to bring your mom truth and beauty. And what I think that you're touching upon is that sorrow does not kill truth and beauty and goodness. And when we're honest to sorrow and we're able to sit and be with sorrow and our own sorrow, in a way, the depths of our joy and all of our awareness of everything true and beautiful and good grows. And there's a greater, more heightened awareness of that in our lives. And, and that in, in a sense that we can't separate them and we can't separate sorrow from love because mm-hmm. Like you're talking about your profound love of your mother and the sorrow of losing her, but yet her still being with you and that love still very much being alive and eternal. And it came back to me when you were talking, Deacon John, I think it was in season five, episode eight. And I only remember that because it was the Easter podcast. And he talked about being with people who were dying and people who had lost people. And he talked about how love never dies. So we don't say I loved that person, but that we love that person still. And that's what I hear in you with your mother. And it's just so beautiful. What a beautiful testimony. I think too, like, you know, in the beginning, I was very tempted to just say like, this book is too full of grief in this unexpected way. Like the book itself, you know, my daughter ends up really thriving and, and I spent eight years, found a mainstream publisher. It was all going great. And then right as my book was going to the printers is when my mom got sick in December. 
December of last year. And the books arrived to my house in March. You, as a writer, you get the first copies, you know, you get a box from the publisher. And I opened it. And this moment that was supposed to be like my life's dream was just so sad. You know, I was like, I just wanted to like close it up, put it away. It just, it felt so inconsequential. And it kind of was for, for a little bit. Like I just was like this is not my life right now. And I told my publicity team at Doubleday, I was like, I just need to be with my family. I cannot promote this. And, you know, I just need to be keeping vigil with my mom. And as time went along after she died, it has become more important to me to dedicate myself once again to this book that I had dedicated to her because it is a tribute to her. And God knew (laughs) when he sent me that dedication that it would be a much more profound dedication than I could have ever known at the time. And so, and, and there is, there is that like temptation to say like, I'm angry about this sorrow and I want my life to be easy. And I thought this was going to be handed to me. And same thing with our children, you know, where you're like, why couldn't it have just been like smooth, you know, even for children without any diagnosis or disabilities, it's like, it is just hard. Like parenting is so tangled with challenge and loss and joy. And, you know, it's all, it's it's just this ball that's completely intertwined. And, and so I'm not sure why I thought my book would be easy. You know, like I, <laughs> I always want things to be easy and they never are. And now my efforts towards getting people to read Remedies for Sorrow are very different than they were when I wrote it. And really, it's very different for people to read my book now, knowing that my mom has died because she is present throughout the book. And I think it makes her the hero that I wanted to portray her as in a different way than I could have made happen on my own if things had had gone the way that I had pictured. So it's like that book, it's like looking straight at grief and looking straight at love. And I think it's like two products in one. It was this work about my life. And now it is this work in this new life that I have without her to still honor her and like find the effort and find the energy to talk about it. Even though sometimes I just want to like hide all the books away and pretend I'm working on something else. It's just not time yet, you know, and I'm waiting to find out what my next project might be. And it, and it might be about my mom and it might be about death and dying and, and some of these experiences that I've had in the last year that were totally unexpected. And, you know, other people would call them coincidental, but I think they were many providential things that happened in the wake of her death. And so just more waiting and, and more using those remedies through these times of waiting. And I I think those remedies come also very naturally into our lives. And that's why they are in my book is it's not this artificial scaffolding of ideas that people could use in a self-help type way. It's really like looking at your life and raising these things up that naturally heal us as we contemplate and give ourselves over to whatever we're going through and giving that experience to God. Yes. Megan, you have such a healing spirit about you. And I want to thank you so much for sharing all of this because a lot of this too is still very fragile and tender for you. Not that it won't be always, but like you said, it's not that long ago that you lost your mom. And that really blesses all of us that you're willing to share and to open up like this and is a beautiful invitation for all of us. And that's what I hope for all of us is that we all open up as you have. I think about you walking, like you were saying, in the fields and where you do your deepest contemplation and thought. And I I pray for that for all of us. I've talked to so many people who are so afraid of the silence and I think the silence is so healing. It can be so intimidating yet it can be so healing. God can just hold us in the palm of his hand in a way and silence that is untouchable. And so I see that in you and I hear that in you. And I love how you talk about these are all very natural things that are being brought to the surface and and to the forefront because God works in what is natural. These are natural remedies to sorrow and to bringing our hearts to the Lord, which which is really in so many ways the most natural and, and healing thing to do. And thank you for talking about tears and your tears. It's so funny. I teared up, Megan, many times when you were sharing. And one very unexpected time was when you said something about, yes, Lindy, your show, it does this. And I think you were pointing to the, the honesty and the authenticity 
of our walks in life and hopefully our walks close to the Lord. And Megan, I don't know if you know this or not, but I teared up because when you use the word show, which I appreciate, yet to me it's like so funny because I never think of it that way. I barely even think of it as a podcast. Like it's really a sharing of the heart and a retreat of the heart. But yet my first podcast was recorded with a dear girlfriend who was really a mentor and a mother mentor figure, an older sister figure of wisdom, mama in spirit in so many ways when she was on hospice. And she passed away a couple days later. And in front of me is her photo always when I'm recording. It's right here. And the other photo in front of me is of my youngest child. And that specific picture reminds me to be fully myself and to be fully authentic. And isn't it amazing that my littlest daughter reminds me of that? Because just really quick, I sent her to spring pictures at school and I'm like, I'm never going to buy these pictures. I never buy school pictures, whatever. She wore like this shirt that's too small. She did her own hair with these big old hair things in them and an extra headband (laughs) with these like pants that are like hysterical. Like, And her smile is the most natural, biggest smile that she has ever had in a school picture. Usually it's kind of awkward, you know, like most kids, like they're like, really, am I supposed to smile right now? And I don't know you. What is this? (laughs) This is weird. I got this. (laughs) But yes, exactly. She's like, I got this. I got this. And so I hope to have this with the Lord and to be fully myself. That's what God calls us to be. And I want to thank you, Megan, for being that because I just feel like we've gotten a snapshot of your soul and in a glorious way that invites us all to healing. So thank you. Thank you, Lindy. And I I feel that way every time I listen to your show when people just bear themselves and it's so touching. I mean, you really hear the person in their integrity and their authenticity coming through. And I do think our kids force us into that, you know, when we want to be productive and just going along with our day and looking great. And, you know, my oldest will be like, I don't think you should wear that, you know, or, you know, just these little (laughs) brutal honesty moments where you're like, okay, like I can depend on you to really like show me the reality of things. And yeah, I love that about the school pictures because I'm always like, why didn't I start ordering those? No matter how bad they are, I wish I'd had like 11 years worth of those things in our house because they are just hilarious. And like, you see the kids personality each year changing, you know, from that like total confidence into like self consciousness or whatever. And and for sure, my second born the one who's deaf, she's eight, and she just owns it. She just owns everything about herself. And her pictures are the same as your youngest, I think, where she's just like, here I am, like, in all my glory, praise God, nobody needs to change anything about me. And and I do just love that. And I learn from it every day, just their earnestness. They don't know any other way, especially the little ones. They just are who they are. And what a beautiful thing. Yes. I love how you said, here I am in all my glory, because that's what God wants. (laughs) So Megan, would you like to close us in prayer? Would you like me to? I love your prayers. I love your voice. Um, I love to listen and close my eyes while you pray. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Dearest God, I just want to thank you for this glorious testimony from Megan. And it just reminds my heart so much about the gift of each human person, the gift of everyone here listening today, the gift of Megan, and just how you mold and shape and craft us and create us to love one another, to love those we most intimately walk with, and to love you with all of our heart and soul. So Lord, I just pray for whatever sorrow anyone listening me may be carrying in her or his heart, Lord, that we all know that you are the ultimate remedy to sorrow and that we come fully to you, knowing that we will be held in the palm of your hand because you love us beyond measure. In your name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. And Megan, where can everyone go to learn more about your book? They can go to my website is Megan Nix, M-E-G-A-N-N-I-X dot com. And it's sold wherever books are sold. I'd be so grateful if you read Remedies for Sorrow. Thank you for blessing me and all of us with your beautiful heart, Megan. And thank you for everyone here gathered. You know, all all of you could be on Mamas in Spirit. God God works in every heart and every life. Sometimes I ask people to be on Mamas in Spirit and they're like, why would you ever ask me? <laughs> and I'm like, because God loves you. You are a beautiful gift and you have a beautiful gift of your story to share. So I pray that we allow our stories to be vibrant and dynamic and ongoing because we constantly reinvite the Holy Spirit, we invite the Lord into our hearts and into our lives to transform us and to bless us exactly where we're at. Can't wait to be together again next time. This is Lindy. Wayne with Mamas in Spirit. May God bless you and yours always.